The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business recently wrote to the Premier to share the results of their most recent member survey. It says that 75% of Nova Scotian small businesses want the government to assess and report on the potential costs of its cap and trade system before it is implemented. One would hope, Mr. Speaker, that that work has already been done. Can the Premier tell this House, did his government calculate the impact of their cap and trade plan on small businesses and jobs, and if so, will he release those results? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the gentleman for the question. I want to thank uh, CFIB for the tremendous work they do advocating on behalf of small businesses across the province and the work that they've done with our government over the last four years, and I look forward to continuing to work with them uh, to ensure that we deal with the issues that their members are facing with. The question that the Honourable member brought forward around the, the cap and trade system, as he would know, uh, we were very fortunate here in Nova Scotia to negotiate with the national government to create an uh, in-province uh, cap-and-trade system that recognizes the hard work by uh, Nova Scotians over the last decade, which will allow us to use those uh, credits that are there, Mr. Speaker, to be able to smooth out the issue across not only will it protect small business, Mr. Speaker, but it will protect the spock books in Nova Scotians. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his first supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, actually Nova Scotians don't know if they're fortunate or not because the government has not told them whether they have done a study on jobs and costs to small business, Mr. Speaker. That's why 75% of our small businesses want more information. They don't even know if the, uh, if the environment will actually get better, Mr. Speaker, or if emissions will go down because our government won't tell them. I truly hope the government has done this work, Mr. Speaker, because Nova Scotians and small business owners, they want to do their bit for the environment, Mr. Speaker. So I'd like to ask the Premier, has his government calculated the anticipated reduction in atmospheric emissions? And if so, will he share those results with all Nova Scotians? The Honourable Premier. Speaker, we're uh, continue to move forward. As the, the Honourable Member would know, that we're on uh, pace now that uh, we'll be 50% below 2005 levels by 2030. Uh, uh, we're at the target now that was set by the national government, but we're not satisfied with that. We're going to continue to move forward uh, with public policy that will ensure not only with, that uh, we green our electricity system in this province, but that we help Nova Scotians when it comes to ensuring their own carbon footprint is reduced through uh, uh, housing grants and other programs they have in place. And uh, we're looking forward to continuing to lead this country uh, in a positive way as uh, we've been doing for the last decade. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, we were on pace to meet our targets well before the government brought forward its cap and trade plan. What Nova Scotians don't know, because the government will not tell them, is whether we're going to get better at emissions or not, or whether it's going to cost more or not. Those are pretty basic questions, Mr. Speaker. No wonder that noted Chronicle Herald columnist Jim Vibert recently wrote, and I quote from him, the cap and trade bill cannot be fully considered by the House, critical elements are missing. Critical elements like, will it help the environment? Will it cost us jobs, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Vibert went on to say, it may be a way to govern, it is not the right way. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier provide the information Nova Scotians are looking for, the cost in jobs to, and to small business and the environmental benefits to Nova Scotians before he enacts the cap and trade program that the is passing this House today? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Again, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. Again, uh, I want to remind, tell the Honourable Member again uh, that uh, we were fortunate to be able to negotiate with the national government to create a, 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 a cap and trade system inside of our province. Mr. Speaker, it recognizes the hard work that has already been achieved. We'll continue to reduce uh, our carbon footprint in this province at the same time using those credits to smooth it out to ensure uh, that the sticker shock will not impact uh, the pocketbooks of Nova Scotians. I want to thank those small business owners across the province. That's why, Mr. Speaker, there's a 14 million dollar tax cut in this particular budget, uh, Mr. Speaker, that was voted on a few days ago. It's why we're leading the country in red tape reduction. The CFIB has recognized that and it's why uh, CFIB recognizes this province as such a positive place uh, for small businesses to operate in. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Th thank you. Media reports today of the physical and emotional abuse of residents at long-term care facilities, of course, are very disturbing. And every bit as disturbing is the allegation also made today by Gary McLeod, Chair of Advocates for the Care of the Elderly, that understaffing is the thing that has led to a great deal of this neglect. There's been a 
a lot of testimony from both nursing home employees and nursing home administrators about how the budget cuts to nursing homes of the last two years have had negative effects on staffing. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier admit that his cuts to nursing homes over the last two years have had negative impacts on the lives of those who live there? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I share, uh, Mr. Speaker, the concern of the, the leader of the Democratic Party when he talks about uh, the, the reported uh, situations that are happening in nursing homes. All of us, when our loved ones uh, come into our care of the province and in, in the institutions in our province, want to ensure uh, the safety of them. Uh, he knows uh, those those. Uh, uh, as they report it, as uh, a 24-hour call that have to get back to those families to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that they are investigated, continue to move forward with him. Uh, the honourable members raised this issue a number of times about the, the cuts that were in, uh, uh, around long-term care. Uh, he would know some of that money had been replaced back inside of the most recent budget that uh, around a food allotment and uh, support and recreational services in those long-term care facilities, Mr. Speaker. And we're going to continue to work. Uh, with the hard-working hard working, uh, health care providers in, in our communities to ensure uh, that our loved ones get the appropriate safe care, Mr. Speaker, that they deserve. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party on his first supplementary. Thank you. Well, I, I would like to respond about the money that uh, was put back in the current budget. We know that over the past two years, $8 million has been removed from the funds uh, that support nursing home budgets, and that in this year's budget, $3.2 million of that has been put back. Uh, in my view, uh, an opportunity has been missed here. Uh, the reset provided by the government's election was a perfect moment to have restored all, 100% of the money that had been taken away over the last two years. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask the Premier if he will restore in his <coughs> next budget all the nursing home funding that's been taken away since he came to office. The Honourable Premier. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, again, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, once as this budget goes, the session ends, Mr. Speaker, whenever that happens. Uh, departments are now in the process of preparing to build uh, a budget that will be introduced in the spring, Mr. Speaker. The, 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 the question that the Honourable Member asked, I'm sure, will be brought in by, uh, by the Department. Uh, and like all uh, issues that are brought in from departments, they'll be given consideration. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party on his final supplementary. Thank you. I began this session asking the Premier if there's a health care crisis. The Premier denied it, as he has multiple times since then. But over the course of the session, we have drawn attention to so many situations. Teresa and Walter Zukaukas and their inability to find a doctor relative to his Parkinson's. Frida Young, transported with cardiac symptoms from one hospital to another in a taxi. Jack Webb, and, and now today to abuse in nursing homes and allegations of its roots in understaffing. Mr. Speaker, I, I am not drawn in the direction of rhetoric or of repetition, but I do think it is fitting to ask the Premier, plainly, once again, will he acknowledge that there is a health care crisis in Nova Scotia, that he has failed to recognize it, and he is failing to address it? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, again, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank those hard-working uh, health care providers across the province for providing care, whether it's access to primary care, or whether it's looking, working in nursing homes uh, across the province, providing support to, to our families. Uh, we will continue to work with them. As I've said many times in this house, we know there are pockets in the province where either it's access to primary health care or supports that are required. We're working with our teams to make sure that, that uh, they have access to that, and we'll continue. Uh, Mr. Speaker, to work with all of the organizations across this province uh, that we can build, build uh, access to primary health care and, Mr. Speaker, ensure that we continue to provide the top quality long-term care that this province is known for. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, of 101 media releases issued by the Nova Scotia Health Authority during the first half of this year, 60 were to announce emergency room closures, 10 were to announce blood clinic closures, and 31, the remaining 31, offered helpful information on hand hygiene, summer sun safety, and more, Mr. Speaker. But what people really want to know is, how is it going with doctor recruitment? Are our surgery wait lists getting longer or shorter? What about the wait times for adolescent mental health services, Mr. Speaker? But those important discussions happen behind <coughs> closed doors at the Health Authority board meetings. Mr. Speaker, it's time to put accountability and transparency back into our Health Authority. Will the Premier act today to ensure that minutes of Health Authority board meetings, where these important discussions happen, are made public? The Honourable Premier. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, I will uh, take the question the Honourable Member provided and give it consideration. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, that is not the first time I've asked that question. When I asked it two weeks ago, the Premier said, and I quote, I will think about the possibility of that happening. Well, Mr. Speaker, this is a $1.6 billion taxpayer-funded organization. Nova Scotians deserve to know what decisions are being made and why about important things like doctor recruitment and surgery wait times and adolescent mental health. Well, the Premier is continuing to think about whether he will allow for transparency and openness at our $1.6 billion health authority. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask him when will Nova Scotians get to see what is going on at the most senior levels of the health authority under his government. The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. Again, as I said to him a few minutes ago, Mr. Speaker, we'll give uh, consideration uh, to that uh, request on behalf of the member and other Nova Scotians who have requested that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we'll take the appropriate amount of time and make sure that, uh, that the decision we make is based on fact, based on the fact that it is in the best interest of Nova Scotia, the best interest of the health care system. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, when that decision is made, we will communicate it to Nova Scotians. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. Jeanette Moore lives in my constituency of Dartmouth North. She has a tumour in her chest and has been told she needs an MRI. Originally, her doctor said she may have to wait for two weeks, and it's now been a month and four days and she still does not have an appointment. Sadly, the wait time for an MRI in Halifax is over a year. Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain why Ms. Moore, who is in urgent need of this health pr procedure, is still waiting? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member uh, for the question. Uh, unfortunately, I think as the, the member would know, I'm uh, not able to speak uh, directly to individual uh, patients uh, within the uh, health care system, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, respecting the, the privacy. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, Mr. Speaker, what I can advise uh, the members, uh, that's one of the advantages of having a provincial health authority, Mr. Speaker, uh, that in fact, uh, where MRI services and, and services uh, provided uh, by facilities across the province uh, where there is a, a longer wait time in, in one area. The opportunity exists, Mr. Speaker, for those uh, patients, those Nova Scotians, uh, to uh, go to another location which may have a, a shorter wait time, Mr. Speaker, to get the health care they need when they need it. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable uh, Member for that advice and I will pass that on. Uh, but once Ms. Moore is able to get in for an MRI, her results will be sent to her doctor. Unfortunately, her Dartmouth doctor is retiring on Tuesday. She has her health records but nowhere to take them. Thousands of people on this doctor's patient list will find themselves in the same situation next week. Mr. Speaker, the government needs to acknowledge this crisis and act. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister give residents of Dartmouth a clear timeline for when they will have access to primary health care? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate uh, the member's question. Of course, it's been a, a frequent discussion uh, throughout this uh, fall session of the legislature, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, where uh, the concerns of Nova Scotians and their access to primary care services has come up, Mr. Speaker. We continue to uh, advise Nova Scotians of our commitment, uh, this budget that we passed and that the opposition parties uh, vote against, Mr. Speaker, uh, in sees investments, Mr. Speaker, to provide uh, additional residency Order, positions. Order, please. The Honourable Minister of Health. Clerkships and other initiatives, Mr. Speaker, to make it more attractive uh, to, uh, to recruit uh, physicians to Nova Scotia. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, the member used a specific example of a retirement taking place in the metro area. Pleased to let the member know that at the same time on Monday of this week, there's a new physician starting in the in metro area as well, uh, and she'll be taking uh, new names, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, as, as patients on her roster as well. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, last night members on all sides of this House came together to enact new provisions to protect victims from intimate images, distribution and cyberbullying. Mr. Speaker, now shortly the victims of these crimes will have legal protections. And I do want to say, Mr. Speaker, a special thanks to the Minister of Justice, the member for Pictou West, the member for Dartmouth South and the Premier himself for willing to come together to make this new law a reality. Mr. Speaker, the sooner that these new legal protections are on the books, the better. So I'm just going to ask the Premier, will he tell the House that that law will be proclaimed into law as soon as possible? Honourable Premier. Yes. 
The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is uh, one of the more enjoyable parts of question period when we're all moving in the same direction. Mr. Speaker, the underlying regulations, of course, are going to be an important part of uh, creating legal protections for the victims of cyberbullying and for the distribution of intimate images. This is something that we can all leave this place whenever this session ends and take some pride in. Can the Premier update the House on the status of the pre preparation of those regulations and will he set a target date for their publishing and for the proclamation of the bill into law, as we're all hoping will be very soon? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll ask uh, the Minister of Justice to respond. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to assure my colleague uh, that this particular bill and the necessary regulations uh, are a priority for government. We have. We have already started that work, uh, Mr. Speaker, around uh, the regulatory elements and components. And uh, without being specific to a date, I want to assure uh, the Leader of the Official Opposition and all colleagues in this House and all Nova Scotians, because of the importance of this bill, Mr. Speaker, this is a priority. We will move those regulations as quickly as we possibly can. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Wellness. Nova Scotians know that our health care system is broken, but a recent episode at the Roseway eating. On Thanksgiving weekend, Councillor Young from Shelburne took his three-year-old child who was experiencing a seizure to the Roseway ER. The emergency room was shutting down because of the lack of a doctor, and I'll table that document. Hospital staff was unable to treat this three-year-old and called 911. My question to the Minister is, when will the Minister admit that when hospital staff resort to calling 911, the Roseway ER is in crisis? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and again, I appreciate uh, the member uh, raising her, her questions on behalf of her constituents and her community, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, again, uh, as of, we've had uh, discussions about uh, specifically the Roseway <coughs> facility, uh, as I'd mentioned uh, to the member uh, previously, uh, Mr. Speaker, I had the opportunity to uh, visit that site, to talk to staff uh, on site, to hear uh, firsthand about uh, uh, both uh, the uh, the moving forward of some, some very good initiatives there in that community, Mr. Speaker, including the uh, the, 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 uh, the, the clinic Mr. Speaker, uh, but uh, in addition, Mr. Speaker, one of the things that uh, was made aware to me was that uh, for the first time in, the, in, in, in decades, Mr. Speaker, they have more uh, primary care providers in that community than they've had in many years. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure the Minister is getting tired of me asking the same question over and over, but quite frankly, I am tired of getting the same empty response for people in Shelburne County. I am worried for the people in Shelburne County. I'm worried for children like Nolan's son. It's been almost four months now since Nova Scotia got a new Minister of, he a new minister of Health, and they expect action. For too long, people have been told help is on the way. The people of Shelburne County have now arranged a public meeting on November the 5th, a chance for them to voice their own concerns. Will the minister commit to attending this meeting and meeting with residents in Shelburne County to make sure that they know those doors are going to be open and they can access emergency care when they need it? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as I'd mentioned, Mr. Speaker, uh, the community, uh, there has been action, Mr. Speaker. There's been action since this government uh, first took office back in 2013, Mr. Speaker. As I'd said uh, previously, Mr. Speaker, uh, the recruitment uh, has been actually very successful, Mr. Speaker, to provide uh, physicians to that community, primary care providers, Mr. Speaker. Been advised uh, by staff of that area that, uh, in fact, they have more physician coverage now, Mr. Speaker, than they've had in many years, uh, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, again, the action is taking place, Mr. Speaker. It's taking place on the ground uh, to provide uh, health care services to that community, just like we're taking action, Mr. Speaker, throughout the province. Order, please. The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, Order, just like... Order, please. The Honourable Minister of Health. Just like we're taking action right across this province, Mr. Speaker, to improve primary care services, mental health services, and continuing care services for all Nova Scotians. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question through you is to the Minister of Justice. On September 26, in this chamber, a number of questions from members, including myself, asked the Minister about the murderer of Daniel Pellrine, and if the murderer should return to the youth facility in Watervale, given the offender's public disclosure of his plans to kill a youth caseworker. I'm certain the minister is aware of this offender and has yet again sadly assaulted another inmate just two days ago. Does the minister believe this time the offender should serve his time in adult jail? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague for the question. Uh, as my colleague would know, yes, I'm familiar with the circumstances uh, that just recently occurred. Uh, the police have been involved. I can't speak specifically to the individual, but I want to assure my colleague, uh, the courts make those decisions, Mr. Speaker. We know of recent cases, including these circumstances, where the court made a decision. We respect the decision of the court, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we're obligated to do so. We believe uh, that the systems put in place by the staff uh, at the, the Waterville facility provide the highest level of safety and security for the residents and the employees who work there, and we'll continue with that as our priority. The Honourable Member for Pictor West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is an offender who the employees are terrified of. I may remind the chamber that uh, out of ruckus in 2016 had many broken bones, concussions. One man had his hip bones to help keep his play, uh, teeth in place. So I want to know, because of Crown Attorney Jim Fife asked Judge Rhonda Van Der Hoek to reprimand the offender to the provincial jail in Burnside until his next court appearance, arguing that he was charged as an adult and should therefore be in an adult jail. Would the minister not agree that this is this would be correct? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm well aware of the uh, the court process and the systems. This is a matter before the court. The courts will make a decision based on the evidence presented. The prosecutor has taken a position. I'm sure that he or she will have a supporting rationale as to why they've taken that position. And the judge will make a determination based on facts, Mr. Speaker. That's the reality of where we find ourselves. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Education. Yesterday, I asked the Minister about shortages of teachers across the province. Well, Mr. Speaker, there's also a shortage of guidance counselors. Given the poor relationship between this government and people working in the education system, few are willing to speak publicly about their concerns, but some have taken to social media, like this recent Facebook post of a picture, and I'll table it, of a sign on the door of one guidance counselor asking students to be patient as they try to care for 655 young people. Although we know this government the government hired some additional staff to address the crisis in Cape Breton, we need to do better than reacting to tragedy. Mr. Speaker, is the minister satisfied that Citadel High, Millwood High, J JL Ilsley High and other schools opened in September with fewer guidance counselors than they had the previous school year? The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, a, very, a very important question. Um, in terms of allocation of resources, making sure that they're going uh, where they need to to support those children who are in, in the most need in our system. Uh, we have increased the amount of student uh, psychologists, of mental health supports in the system, Mr. Speaker. I think that's important to note. Uh, that has improved every single year since we've been in. Uh, the Council, sorry, the uh, Commission on Inclusive Education currently is looking at this particular question as well um, and if we should adjust the funding model and the allocation of these resources in the system. So we do anxiously await uh, their findings, and in the meantime, we'll work with our boards on any specific cases of concern that do arise. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Speaker, despite assurances to the contrary, there continues, based on the information that we uh, have received anecdotally, to be a shortage of other specialists in the classroom. These professionals work with our most vulnerable students, and without them, we run the risk of children falling through the cracks. Mr. Speaker, speech-language pathologists are being asked to take on additional schools. Some cover more than six schools, an individual staff person. We know that we need more educational program assistance in the classroom to support learners with diverse needs. 
This need for additional supports in our classrooms has been raised loud and clear by teachers and parents, many of whom were outside this legislature in February, and it seems the situation is only getting worse. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Education loves to talk about the Commission on Inclusion, so I will ask the Minister, can he end the uncertainty for parents and teachers and commit today to fund the implementation of the recommendations of that Commission? The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It is important to note that um, special supports needs have been protected by this government. Um, unlike previous governments who have reduced those supports because of declining enrollment, we have not. We've provided additional funding to boards to um, hold and enhance those services. We have hired more speech pathologists in the system. We have hired more mental health clinicians, Mr. Speaker. By the end of our term, every single school in this province will have access to mental health clinicians through the Schools Plus program, Mr. Speaker. And, and, and beyond that, you know, I, I wish we took more time in this legislature to recognize all the great stories of success where these people are having life-changing impacts on our students. There are challenges in the system, Mr. Speaker. They are systemic, and that's why we are moving forward to transform the system so it better serves every single student in it. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadabit Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Uh, going back to the story that was in the paper today concerning long-term care, uh, CBC report says that the last two years there have been 46 confirmed cases of emotional, physical, sexual abuse in our province, province's nursing homes. A longtime advocate for elder care says nursing homes are understaffed, which contributes to this terrible situation. So will the minister restore funding to nursing homes to decrease the amount of abuse on the residents? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for raising this very important uh, question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, what I think uh, is very important for all members of this legislature to know, and it may be important information to share with uh, their constituents as well, and, and perhaps even family members. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we're one of three provinces across this country that actually has a legislation, a Protection for Persons in Care Act, Mr. Speaker, uh, to ensure that we have the appropriate process in place to respond if there are issues that, uh, wherein uh, people do not follow the rules uh, governing uh, the care of persons in our residents. Mr. Speaker, we know that uh, uh, any time that a uh, situation comes when uh, the people who are uh, working uh, or the environment does not provide the care and the services uh, that we expect uh, that uh, are defined by the licenses, Mr. Speaker, uh, that action needs to be taken. That's why we perform the investigation. We have this act in place. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadabit Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have, uh, in my lifetime, visited numerous new nursing homes in, uh, in both professions. And I've seen staff that have gone way above the call of duty. And, but sadly, we just don't have enough of those individuals. The information in the CBC story shows that facilities do not always report allegations of abuse. I have met so many seniors who have said, I am afraid to say anything because their lifeline are those individuals that look after them day in and day out and they are <coughs> afraid to say anything. Seniors Advocate Gary McLeod told CBC the Protection for Persons in Care team is understaffed. Will the Minister increase resources to the Protection for Persons in Care team to make nursing homes safer? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, picking up, I like to uh, let the, the member know and just take uh, take the opportunity that if the member or anyone knows, uh, Mr. Speaker, of a, an allegation of abuse or, or mistreatment within our uh, facilities, Mr. Speaker, that they can call 1-800-225-7225, Mr. Speaker, to report to the staff who will uh, look into the situation, Mr. Speaker, with respect to whether or not we have enough staff to, uh, to uh, fulfill uh, the Protection for Persons in Care Act. Mr. Speaker, all allegations that are reported to, to uh, the department uh, through this act, uh, which again, that uh, phone number uh, provides that. We re look into those situations, Mr. Speaker, within 24 hours, uh, Mr. Speaker, to get the information that's needed, take the necessary steps moving forward. Uh, that may include a more detailed investigation, uh, actions taken against the facility or individuals, reports back to professional bodies, Mr. Speaker, and in the worst of worst situations, Mr. Speaker, reports to criminal uh, charges through uh, the RCMP or the police force. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
I have a question for the Minister of Health. The College of Physicians and Surgeons have changed their requirements for licensing foreign doctors here in Nova Scotia. Those that have come here since 2015 now must have PATH certification, which will require them to pass the Canadian, Canadian exams for their specialty. Without passing these exams, they will not be able to continue to practice medicine here in Nova Scotia. These physicians are an important part of our healthcare system. Most of these physicians, Mr. Speaker, work, work full-time hours and do not have close access to an academic setting to support studying for these exams. The question I have to the Minister of Health is, would the Department of Health work with Dalhousie Med School program and the College of Physicians and Surgeons to create an academic study solutions so that we can help support these physicians to pass these exams so they can stay and practice medicine here? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and again, I thank the member for raising this uh, this question uh, on the floor of the House. Uh, indeed, Mr. Speaker, as the member uh, referenced in the preamble, the concern around uh, changes to uh, how the uh, college, that uh, professional body that governs and licenses uh, physicians, Mr. Speaker, uh, has, has uh, enhanced the requirements, uh, which has affected uh, some physicians in the, in the province of Nova Scotia. Uh, indeed, Mr. Speaker, uh, we've committed to uh, working with with the, the college. Uh, indeed, uh, this uh, question came up uh, at a meeting with Doctors Nova Scotia, which uh, the uh, registrar for Doctors Nova Scotia was at as well. So indeed, Mr. Speaker, I think this is a, an issue that's been brought forward that's on the radars of many, uh, and we're committed to working together to try to uh, both manage the safety of the environment, uh, but also the, the needs of our physicians. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And and thank you to the Minister for your answer. I know recently this week we unfortunately had a physician in, in Cumberland who reached out to Dalhousie Med School to look for supports to help them prepare for the exam and they were denied. And I realize that the College of Physicians and Surgeons is separate from the Department of Health, but I thought if the Department of Health could work with Dalhousie Med School to offer solutions with the, especially the rural physicians that live two hours away from Dalhousie, that it may indeed help these physicians to pass the exam. So I'm wondering if the minister would make that commitment to try and encourage Dow to work with these physicians. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, you know it, it pleases me to stand uh, here, Mr. Speaker, to acknowledge uh, the member opposite. Uh, far too often in this legislature, when people on the the opposite side, Mr. Speaker, members of the opposition, the official opposition, uh, raise uh, to to make a, a position, Mr. Speaker, uh, they they come to criticize, but not with uh, recommendations and solutions uh, or recommendations to move forward, Mr. Speaker. And I appreciate I appreciate uh, the the suggestion that the the members brought forward here, and of course, Mr. Mr. Speaker, as I've already indicated, we are working, uh, and that's a, a, a suggestion that's brought forward. I'll certainly be bringing it as part of the work that we're doing, uh, Mr. Speaker, to consider. Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Previously, we asked this government yet again why they failed to give CBU the same treatment as they gave Acadia. When I asked the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education about this, he told us he gave them more than their ask and he repeated this claim in the media. And I could table those, Mr. Speaker. We showed yesterday how wrong the minister was by tabling a FOI pop showing the direct ask for government by CBU was 4.1 million. And Mr. Speaker, I know the minister's an accountant, and I'm not, but I did confirm with, with the member for Cumberland South, who's a chartered accountant, that $4.1 million is more than $1 million. So my question is the minister, why did the minister tell the members of this house and the public that CBU was given more funding than it asked for when it clearly was not? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's uh, my pleasure to get up and clarify the uh, question that came today and question that came yesterday. Mr. Speaker, it's very simple. The $4.1 million that was asked by CBU was a one-time ask. What we did is we gave them a million dollars a year embedded in their funding, which is continuous on a go-forward basis. CBU identified $4.1 million as a shortfall over the next five years that they required. They asked the department for a one-time ask of $4.1 million. What we did is we looked at it and we said, we're gonna bump up the funding a million dollars a year, which over the next five years will be five million, but over the next 10, 20 years could be 10, 20 million years. So Mr. Speaker, as I've said, 
It is embedded in our funding and it's continuous. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Acadia was also not asked to pay back a $7 million SOFI loan that everyone else was required to do. The Premier said it was because of a promise made by the previous government. But the CBC showed that Acadia was requested extension consistently between 2011 and 2017, and they were denied. Alternatively, the Minister of Labour and, Labor and Advanced Education said it was because of a report by Deloitte and Touche. Now, neither of these stories points to the previous government, Mr. Speaker. This government is fully responsible. So my question is, who has the right answer? Is it the Premier or the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'd like to say that myself and the Premier were always both right. Mr. Speaker, it's very simple. Acadia went to the previous government. They asked for... They asked for funding to help them with their operations. What the previous government did is they gave them a SOFI loan which was intended for infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, there was no infrastructure tied to that loan. The loan was forgiven. That was the original term that was given to Acadia. Take this money, you can cover your operations. But infrastructure money was given to them, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, to clarify my comments to CBC, what I said was, as we looked at, at making Acadia whole in terms of their funding, why would we sit there and give them money on one hand and take money on the other hand? It made no sense, Mr. Speaker. We leveled the playing field, $3.5 million added to their budget. The SOFI loan was eliminated as was promised by the previous government. <clears throat> the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community Services. I recently asked the Minister about the clawback of child support from recipients of income assistance, and I was encouraged by her response. On October 18th, the government announced improvements to the process for the enforcement and collection of child support. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister please provide a timeline for ending the clawback of child support payments from single parents receiving income assistance? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. As she is aware, because we've uh, discussed it quite a bit during budget estimates, we're in the process of transformation of the department, and as soon as we're able to give you more information on any of the initiatives that we determine we're going to undertake, we will be happy to share them with the House. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, ending the clawback of child support will put an average of $2,000 annually per child back in the pockets of single parents receiving income assistance. We appreciate the steps taken to collect the millions owed to children. We continue to be concerned that these efforts will have no benefit for children whose parents receive income assistance. Mr. Speaker, will the minister agree to end the clawback of child support and make this change retroactive? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. As I've indicated to the Honourable Member previously, we are in the process of transformation of our uh, employment supports and income assistance system. We will be happy to share with her any details when they are, in fact, ready. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Speaker, a question for the Minister of Health. Our definition of what palliative care means has changed. Health care providers have been educated more in this approach and is being chosen more frequently as a method of care. Would the minister be in favor of the federal government making hospice palliative care a medical service covered under the Canada Health Act? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member uh, opposite for raising this question. Uh, what the member may uh, or may not be aware, Mr. Speaker, indeed, uh, not just, uh, I think, from a professional perspective, indeed, I think as a society, uh, we're becoming uh, more aware, uh, Mr. Speaker, of end-of-life care and uh, uh, the, the approaches to ensure uh, that uh, Nova Scotians, that individuals that reach that stage of their life uh, have uh, appropriate care and services. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that's one of the reasons why in our previous mandate uh, my predecessor, the uh, current Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage, worked with the Department, Mr. Speaker, and other stakeholders to establish a framework that goes towards uh, uh, establishing uh, hospice uh, facilities, providing uh, this type of care, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so again, uh, this is an area that we have taken an active work on. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Inverness. No answer there, Mr. Speaker, on whether the uh, Minister would be in favour of that. But, you know, I can understand the Minister's reservation. The province would then be forced to ensure that full palliative care is provided. It would affect our province more than other provinces because of our aging population. And we know the deal that this government signed when it broke rank from the other provinces uh, seemed to be more in favour of the federal government's interests than our own and our people here in Nova Scotia. So, Mr. Speaker, I think of one example 
oxygen at home for people suffering from breathlessness. Mr. Speaker, in 2014, I asked uh, the former Minister of Health this question, and he indicated, I'll table that, he indicated a provincial palliative care program will be addressed. Mr. Speaker, why do palliative care societies continue to have to fundraise for this medical service? Because while it is free for people in hospital, it is not free for everyone at home. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and as uh, the member uh, mentioned in, his, uh, in the preamble of the first uh, question, Mr. Speaker, there have been a, a lot of advances and changes, uh, uh, both in, in terms of a recognition of the uh, uh, nature and the, the opportunities uh, and the approaches uh, to end-of-life care, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that includes a wide variety. As the member mentioned, there are uh, facilities and, and there are certain uh, care that's provided in a hospital setting. Uh, there are uh, individuals individuals who, who uh, receive this type of care in a home uh, setting now, Mr. Speaker, and they can receive this care with the support of, of uh, clinicians, a wide range of clinicians, including paramedics, Mr. Speaker. Their, their, their scope of practice has, has, has uh, expanded. Uh, so again, uh, it is an emerging and evolving uh, area of uh, health care. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. As we're all aware, the number of new Canadians diagnosed with Alzheimer's each year is growing, and last year over 25,000 loved ones learned that they were going to be personally facing this challenge. As we've heard in this House, it is the family and the caregivers who take on the selfless task of looking after those who are dealing with this chronic health condition. With the government's increased focus on people aging in place, we all know that this increased attention and programming needs to be funded to allow for the training and support for non-health professionals taking on the task of being unpaid caregivers. The Alzheimer's Society's grant of $400,000 over three years comes to an end in March of 2018. My question to the Minister is, will he commit today to extending that grant for the next three years, or even better, commit to a permanent funding for this organization to allow them to be the leaders in further developing and implementing Nova Scotia's dementia strategy? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the member bringing uh, this question uh, about the Alzheimer's, indeed, uh, dementia to the floor of the legislature. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, uh, this is a, an area that uh, goes uh, far too often uh, unacknowledged uh, in, in our society. Mr. Speaker, I had the, the privilege uh, in my role as Minister of Health uh, earlier this week to attend a, a conference, uh, I believe it's the 28th annual uh, conference of the Alzheimer's Society of Nova Scotia uh, earlier this week, uh, where, uh, indeed, They've uh, praised uh, the work and the collaboration that's been taking place between the society and, and those advocates and care providers uh, and the province of Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. So I see, uh, again, uh, we've uh, done great work uh, with their support. We continue to support them, Mr. Speaker, and look forward uh, th to the following question. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure if I can interpret that as a yes, but I'm going to uh, put that out to the universe. Mr. Speaker, there is, there is no one sitting here today who does not know somebody with arthritis. In fact, given all of our ages, uh, we might be hard-pressed to find somebody sitting here who doesn't already experience the pain and functional challenges that come from the hundreds of varieties of rheumatoid and osteoarthritis, as well as other arthritic conditions. Given the impact on one's quality of life and one's ability to work with these health challenges, one would assume that there is funding for the only nonprofit organization in the province solely devoted to helping those with arthritis. However, this is not the case. The Nova Scotia Arthritis Society does not have any funding. Will the minister commit today to providing similar funding to the Arthritis Society as he does to the Alzheimer's Society? The Thank Honourable you, Mr. Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member uh, for bringing this uh, question uh, to the floor of the House. Uh, obviously, uh, an, an area the member's uh, passionate about. I believe she's uh, spoken uh, about uh, these conditions uh, during budget estimates as well. Uh, as the member would uh, know, uh, major uh, budget commitments are, are uh, outlined in our budget document, Mr. Speaker, a budget uh, that's been uh, tabled, uh, debated extensively, and indeed uh, uh, the estimates passed uh, earlier in this session. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, where uh, the, the member of the organizations, uh, uh, even if they haven't received uh, direct uh, dedicated funding identified in the budget, it's important to recognize that there are many uh, program opportunities, uh, granting opportunities through the Nova Scotia Health Authority and or the Department of Health and Wellness uh, that organizations are able to receive uh, funding that may not be explicitly outlined or identified through the budget process. Thank you. 
The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Education. The school capital construction project list for Shigdekto Central School Board continues to show a new elementary school for Spring Hill as their number one priority, second overall, Mr. Speaker, to an addition in another part of the province. All that's required now is for the Minister of Education to approve the funding so the students of Spring Hill can get the new elementary school that they deserve. So I'd like to ask the Minister, will he tell the House now, will Spring Hill Elementary be approved for funding by his department this year so those kids can get the education that they deserve? The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. There are a lot of capital pressures uh, on our system. We have uh, over... Uh, 50 priorities that have been submitted to the department. We are in the process of reviewing those on a priority basis. Um, our focus will always be on, on investing in the capital projects where uh, the highest need is, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that process is ongoing now, and we do hope to have uh, our full capital plan released before the new year. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do want to point out that a new elementary school for Spring Hill has been at the top of the priority list for Chignecto Central for five years now, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to share with the Minister the reasons why. I have the project description done by the engineers of the school board with me, and it says, and I quote directly, the primary reasons for closing the existing schools is the inability to provide a complete public school program at West End Memorial Elementary, and there is no ground space for an expansion of Junction Road Elementary. Mr. Speaker, would the Minister agree that when the schools are no longer able to provide a complete public school program because of their decrepit state, that it's time to approve a new elementary school for Spring Hill? The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Of course, uh, with the, uh, the spirit of those comments, I do agree. We want our children to have access to the best, uh, most modern facilities possible, Mr. Speaker. We are working our way through that process to ensure that those areas of the highest need uh, that need these funds, uh, receive them in a timely manner. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on the system financially. These are incredibly expensive projects, Mr. Speaker, and I do look forward to uh, releasing our final list uh, once they have um, undergone the complete approval process. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. I recently heard from a constituent who self-funded her first degree but struggled to find meaningful work in the province after that. So she returned for a diploma program at Dalhousie University a few years later and took out student loans to pay for her fees. In her letter to me, she said the loan seemed reasonable as she was set to start a career in the then booming film industry. However, when the industry crashed after the government cancelled the film tax credit, my constituents' prospects disappeared. Now she is scrambling to make ends meet because her loans for that diploma program are not eligible for the Nova Scotia Student Loan Forgiveness Program. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister explain why students upgrading their qualifications in order to attach to the labour market are excluded from accessing the same benefits as bachelor degree students? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, answer to that is very simple. The forgiveness to the student loan is meant for your first degree, your bachelor's degree. It's not meant for people who are upgrading, getting master's, doctorate degrees. So what it is, is it is for individuals to get their first degree and get their career started. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Needham. Mr. Speaker, my constituent self-funded her first degree. She's committed to staying in her home province, but is finding her debt unmanageable. Had she taken a degree rather than a diploma, she could have saved herself $10,000 through the loan forgiveness program. If this government is so concerned about helping young people attain the skills and qualifications they need to find good jobs here in Nova Scotia, why are those trying to fast-track their education being punished for doing so? So will the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education commit to changing the student assistance program to allow diploma students to qualify for the loan forgiveness. The program. Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Mr. Speaker, what I will commit to is expanding the program as much as our finances do allow us to. Mr. Speaker, this is a great program. It actually amounts to more than $10,000. amounts to over $30,000 in loan forgiveness. I'd like all Nova Scotians to understand this program. Anyone who qualifies for a Nova Scotia student loan, $6,800 a year is the maximum amount. Upon graduation, and that's up to five years of university undergraduate, your total loan is wiped out to zero. 
And Mr. Speaker, to go a step further, any individuals that might have a disability, we've made it 10 years for them to ensure that they can get an undergraduate degree. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Mr. Speaker, I am doubtful that I'm going to get a response to this question, so I'm going to start with this. In 2013, as a farmer in Antigonish County, a young man came to my doorstep after I met him at an event, and he currently now sits in the house. He was asking for my vote, and he uh, actually came to my farm and sat with me on my veranda for about an hour. And I thought, you know, I think that maybe this young man might actually make a difference. This young man, I don't see him in this house any longer. I'm very sad to say. He's become a regurgitator of talking points or an actor speaking a script, perhaps. I, I, I am going to say that. He, is, uh, he actually put it to me that perhaps I should run for politics. Order, and I please. Did. The time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired.